when we say the word surrender, I think most of the time that has for us a kind of a negative connotation. We think about surrendering, meaning that we give up and that we have failed. Uh, we talk about surrendering in, in a time of war uh, could be devastating for a nation, for a country. Uh, we talk about uh, surrendering on the football field. A football team can, can end the game before the game is over, can't they? If they surrender the game too soon. Uh, I'm afraid that this week, w this weekend, my team uh, surrendered before they ever got to the football field. The Texans, yeah. But, but we, can, we can quit before the battle is over. So surrender often has a negative connotation. But I want you to think this morning about the, the reality that, that surrender is not always bad. Surrender is not always negative. In fact, uh, just this morning, let me say this without getting all teary. Uh, this morning I got a call and I went to see uh, Marty and Gail Phelan. Their daughter, Debbie, I mean, most of you know Debbie. Some of you are new here, uh, maybe have not had an opportunity to meet Debbie. Debbie, was, I think, was 56 years old. Um, but um, she was challenged in many ways. She was, uh, every time you talked to her, she's like talking to a child. And, but she was always happy, always had a smile on her face. But Debbie went to be with uh, Jesus this morning. And, and so uh, just I want you to pray for the Phelan family today. I know it's a terrible loss for them. And uh, for those of you that knew her, she, I, anybody ever see Debbie didn't have a smile for you? Yeah. So uh, we're going to miss her uh, terribly. But this morning at 5.15, Debbie, you know, just surrendered in a way to, uh, to God's will for her life and went to be with Jesus. Surrender is not always bad. In fact, uh, we practice surrender all the time. You realize that? You know, I haven't flown a lot of places in my life. Don and I have traveled around some. And, but I, here's what I do know, that when I get onto a, a, a commercial airliner, I climb and I get into my seat, I know that in many ways in that moment, I am surrendering my life to the person that's in, that, uh, in the cockpit of that plane flying. I'm, I'm trusting them. And I'm trusting that plane to get me to where I want to go. So I have to surrender my will. I have to sur surrender my fear or anxieties or whatever in order to get onto the plane. And we do that when we climb into our car. Um, I don't know. How many, of, how many guys, how many of you in here do most of the driving every time you drive somewhere for your wife you drive? Okay. How many of you ladies drive if you're with, together with your husband? Okay. Okay. Well, see, I do most, I do the driving. And so rarely... If Don and I are going anywhere together, rarely do I surrender the steering wheel to her. It's not because I don't trust her driving. It's just that, well, that's just what I do, okay? And so surrender is a part of, a part of life. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 24, it says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Let me rephrase that last verse. For whoever wants to save their lives will surrender it. Whoever surrenders their life for me will find it. Surrender is an essential part of our faith. We're going to talk about surrender this morning. I'm not going to necessarily break this particular verse uh, down as I would, would like to because that's not really where I want to go with that today. But it, it, it gives us, what I want us to see in that verse is the essential nature of of our relationship to Jesus Christ is based upon that reality. It's based upon the reality of surrender. And so we want to talk about that today. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, most of you, probably many of you have that verse memorized. It says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's God's intention and design for you in, in your life. God intends for you to have hope 
and he intends for you to have a future. That's God's direction. Now, here's the thing. How do we claim that? How do we have that hope? How do we have that future? How do we claim what it is that God has for us? Well, I tell you, there's only one way to do it. You're not going to claim what God has for you by, <clears throat> by assault. You're not going to take it from him. You're not going to force his hand. God will not be manipulated. God will not be coerced. God, we can only approach God to receive what he has for us. We can only do so in one way. And that's on our knees in surrender. You know, that's what I loved about the video that I played at the very beginning. You know, we can, we can fight. We, we can resist. We can struggle all of our lives. And I want to tell you this morning, I have no doubt that there's somebody right here listening to my voice today that's in that exact place. You're struggling, you're resisting, you're fighting, you're trying to find your own way and do it your way and find your path in this life. And there's only one, when the, when the man stands up and takes the flag of surrender and surrenders to the cross, that's the only way that we can have God's purpose and plan for our life. Now there are three things I want to just quickly share with you this morning. We're going to share in the, in the observance of the Lord's Supper today. And, and so as we come to this the, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, what Jesus instituted for his church, a beautiful uh, symbol, a beautiful memorial that, that would remind us of the price that was paid for our salvation. As we do so, you see, we come to, to the table of the Lord only in surrender. And that's why I wanted to talk about that this morning. So what has to be surrendered? What has to be surrendered to God in order to have his purpose and plan, in order to have salvation? What needs to be surrendered to God in order to, to come and participate in the Lord's Supper in this ordinance we have this morning? The first is this. We need to surrender. You have to surrender your mind. You have to surrender your mind to the Lord. Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 23 says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new, look at this, in the attitude of your minds. To be, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. We have to surrender our mind. In fact, I'm convinced that nothing else that I have to say this morning will ever happen. Nothing can ever really be achieved in our lives until we first come to the place that we are willing to surrender our mind to God, to Christ. Because I'll tell you, and I've heard, and you've probably heard this said before, and it's absolutely true, that the mind is the battlefield of the soul. The mind is where the battles are fought, and where they're either lost or won, whether there's a, either victory or defeat. And this is where the only way, see, we can have victory in Christ is that we have come to the place that we have surrendered our minds. We have a new attitude in our mind and in our thinking. You know, can I just can I just say that in a broad sense today, in looking at the world in which we live, you know, there's so many things that, if you really are honest and look at it, so many things that the scriptures teach that in our world today are considered kind of passe. They're kind of considered old and archaic and worn out philosophies and ideas. You ever notice that? Ideas about sexual morality, for instance. How has the world changed just in your lifetime? The way we view things. And here's what I'm, I'm not just picking on that, I'm just, that's probably one of the, the, the most important that I see today. And I'm not just picking on that for some, for some particular reason. I'm just raising that because here's the thing. It seems like that in our humanity, we are so bold in our thinking to think that somehow our thinking and our morality, our way of viewing things, our mental model, you know, we have a, all of us have a, a place on which we stand mentally in our mind to view the world around us. And, and if, if we're not standing on the word of God in, to view the world around us, then we're going to be sucked into philosophies and ideas that are, that are against the word of God and take us in the wrong direction. Here's what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm not 
I'm not trying to make any direct connections or any kind. I'm just saying look at this in a broad sense. But it seems to me like the further we go from the foundation of the Word of God, the further we move off of that pivotal center, the more crazy that our world seems to get. The more violence it seems to take over. The more brokenness that we see. I hear people proclaiming the, how archaic the Word of God is. And their thinking is that I should be able to do The rest of the world is doing this. Why shouldn't I do it? I mean, what's the harm in it? It's my body. I should be able to do what I want to with it. And yet on the other side of that, I'm doing more and more and more counseling and dealing with people whose lives are so broken over the very reality that they're declaring. So I'm just saying we have to surrender our thinking. We have to surrender our minds to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to His Word. And even if it doesn't agree with our friends, even if it doesn't agree with what the world is saying, even if it doesn't agree with what every uh, major sitcom or drama on TV is, is showing us, we have, to, we have to make this our mental stand. Philippians 4 eight says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, praiseworthy, think about such things. Let that be your mind. Isaiah 26.3 says this, you will keep, look at this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. If your mind is set on Jesus, if your mind is set on the word of God, and that becomes your worldview, then, then that will, it'll make all the difference. So we have to surrender, first of all, our minds to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we need to surrender our body. We surrender our body to God. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, what I'm saying is that Here's a good example. We just said our mental, our worldview, how we view the world, where we stand to do so is going to affect how, how we interpret and how we intake the rest of the word of God. Here we have a, a verse in 1 Corinthians telling us that our body is not our own. But here's one of the greatest, one of the greatest conflicts in the world today, in America today. One of the great conflicts is who, who owns my body? You know, and we're being told by media all around us, we're being told that your body is your body and that you should make the choice. You should make the decision about what you're going to do or what you're not going to do. I'm not just now talking about abortion, although we're, it certainly involves abortion. I'm not just talking about sexuality, because, but it certainly involves sexuality. I'm not just talking about how we view our dinner table, but it certainly involves how we view our dinner table, doesn't it? it it's not, not talking only about drugs. But how we use drugs and what we think about drugs certainly involves our body. Who owns it? Who has the right to decide? You see, the world is saying, the world is saying, you have the right. It's your body. You decide. Wrong. Wrong. The scripture says, do you not know? Don't you want to say that? Haven't y'all heard? Haven't you gotten this? Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, who you, whom you have received from God. Look at this. You are not your own. You are not your own. You were bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, here's the deal. Track with me now. You'll never, you'll never surrender your body if you haven't first surrendered your mind. And, and then the third thing. The third thing is to surrender your will. Surrender your will. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life.
but the one who will come. See, ultimately, ultimately what we do with our life, ultimately where we go in our lives, ultimately who we influence with our lives, it's going to be determined by the choices that we make in our lives. And so, you know, but here, here, again, unless we surrender our mind, we will never surrender our bodies. And if, unless we've surrendered our mind and our body, we will never surrender our will to God. See, the will is simply that part of us that says what we will or will not do. Will. I will or I won't. And many of us are coming before God and we're saying, God, I want what you have to offer. I want, I want salvation. I want to be released from my sins. I want the promise of eternal life. I want the good things. I want a healthy, happy family. I want my children to love me. And I want, I want all of the blessings you have to offer. But I won't do this. Or I won't do that. I won't surrender my body in this respect. I won't surrender my mind and my thinking in this respect. But I'm just, I just got to tell you, people, you know, honestly, that's not the way it works. You know, we only come to God in one way, and that is in, in, a, in, a, in a posture of surrender. But understand this, that once we've surrendered to Jesus, we become victorious over everything else. Once we surrender to Jesus, we become victorious over everything else. And I want to promise you this. You, you know, I'm not going to point any, I'm just going to tell you. If you'll take time to get before God and look at your own life, if you'll be honest enough to get before God and look at your own life and say, here's some areas of my life I've never surrendered to Him. Here's some areas that I'm saying, I know what you said, God. I know what your word says, but... If you can honestly look at that and, and begin to evaluate it, you'll begin to see that that area of non-surrender in your life comes an area of defeat in your life. See, go back. I know the plans that I have for you, declares. Not the pastor, not mom and daddy, not grandpa, grandma. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Isn't that what we've been talking a lot about lately? Hope. He says, I want to give you hope. And this morning, before we observe the, the Lord's Supper together, you know, the scriptures tell us that we're not, it's not that we're sinless or that we're perfect disciples of Christ in order to come and participate in the Lord's Supper. But what it does say is that we ought to be at least honest enough to look inside our own heart and say, God, is there an area of my life that I haven't surrendered to you? And the last thing I want you to think about as we approach this is think about this. The Lord's Supper is to remind us of the greatest surrender that the world has ever seen. When the King of Heaven, the Lord of Hosts, came down, came down in the form of a baby, grew up to be a man, and listen to this, he surrendered his mind to God. To God. He said, Lord, the only things that I say are the things that you have said. The things that I do are the things that you do. Jesus surrendered his mind to the Heavenly Father. And then what did he do? He surrendered his body. And he gave it why? For you, for me. He surrendered his will. He said, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to take on the world's sins. I don't want to die a criminal's death on a cross. He said, nevertheless, not what? Not my will, but your will be done. We had before us this morning the, the act of the greatest surrender that the world has ever seen. And let me tell you something. If Jesus can do it, so can you. And so can I. 
So as we approach this invitation time, before we do the Lord's Supper, we're going to have an invitation. The invitation is simply that. You ever been invited to somebody's table? Come on over. Come and have a bite to eat. The Lord is inviting you to his table. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior this morning, then you can do so simply by giving your heart and your life to him. You see, it's like getting into that into that airplane, sitting down in that seat. When you, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you're, you're putting your life in his hands and you're saying, no longer me but you. I'm not in charge, you are. I surrender my mind to you. I surrender my body to you. I surrender my will to you. Save me. Have you ever done that? If you've never done that, then in this invitation time, I'm inviting you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer already, then I'm just asking you to take this time to reflect and say, God, what is, what is the area of my life that I need to surrender to you today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have 